This is Patrick Russell. I'm interviewing Albert Fig for the first time in Aromanch. It's today is uh, Saturday, June 6th. That's correct. 2015. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. Yeah. You were telling me a story about Hill 112 yesterday. Do you remember that? I certainly do. I don't remember as okay. many years ago. Very good. Now, before we begin on your story, I want to learn a little bit more about you when you're growing up, okay? Yeah. All right. So why don't you tell me when you were born? I was born in 1920, June the 12th, 1920. So my 95th birthday will be in five, six days' time. Very good. Well, early happy birthday to you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and where were you born? I was born at a place called Chiselton in Wiltshire, which is the southwest of England. It's known as the Wessex area. And the reason for that is that we carried a, a flag with this wyvern on it. And that wyvern was the flag that King Arthur carried in them days. So it was adapted and carried by us all the way through even World War I. And it was carried with pride with us, all of us, uh, during the whole of the camp, uh, whole of the war. I joined in uh, the territorials in February 1939 at 18 years of age, and I was called up on the 1st of September 1939 because I was in the territorials. And then on the 3rd of September, then war was declared. So that meant then I become a regular soldier. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your hometown. What was it well, like? It's not a hometown, it's a village. And uh, as I said, I was born in 1920. And I can remember back to, I sound ridiculous, my mother says to me many times that it's impossible to help it to think back. And I can remember back when I was 18 months old. And mum said to me, you could not possibly do that, Albert. She said, it was too young. I said, well, can you tell me why I can remember being carried up this bedroom on a ladder? And, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, Dad was um, per, uh, making an extension to the house. He said, and he put a new stairs in, and also he put in a, what they call a copper house. Now, a copper house is where you'll have one of these big, large coppers with a fire underneath by wood. And this is where she used to boil all her clothes. And I can remember that, and it was unbelievable. But then, when I got a little older, I went to school, infant school, at four and a half. And time I was five years of age, and I've always had this, I don't know what you call it, a challenging attitude. Everybody, I know my mum said to me one day, Albert, if you don't stop yourself, you'll fall over the cliff. <laughs> it must have said, you walk too fast. But it was when I was five years of age, I was met, I had a great friend at school called Alan Pope. And he was the same age as me. And uh, <laughs> he was a bit of a, a challenger as well. What he used to do, he used to go into the toilet and roll up bits of paper, matches, and use it as a cigarette. Well, that was all right, but to me, I thought, oh, that's all, you know, it, it goes so fast. It's time you light it, it's flame, it's gone, so you don't get any smoke. So I got on the, I don't know where, I got on the idea of using I don't think I've ever heard of it, Jaffa orange paper. Now, Jaffa oranges were big like that. This is going back to the 1920s. 
and they had referendum a paper. And when you took the paper off and you rolled it up and then you lit it, it just smoldered. And you go, <laughs> we'll blow it out. <laughs> and, uh, whoa, God, we just, and uh, at the top of the village, the lane, where I've born Chisel uh, Slipper Lane, there was a shop called uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miller. Now, I could go in that shop, and the old man, he would serve me with anything. If I went in with a halfpenny, because that's about as much money I could have, an halfpenny, and I go in with a halfpenny, and I wanted a gobsnapper, you know, that's one of these big sweets, big as that, and you suck it and suck it and suck it until it dissolves. Well, he'd give me two. So I give one to my mate, Alan. Well, that's fine. Now, his wife, very tall and Victorian with black clothes on it, and she would never do anything. She wouldn't give anything away, not like the old man. So I always used to hang back, wait till she's serving somebody else, and I always go up to the old man and say, can I have some orange paper? Yeah, what do you want that for? Well, I don't you wouldn't remember this, but in them days, you never had toilet paper. You used to have newspaper and cut, them, cut it up in little bits. And you'd make a hole in it of several pieces and put a piece of string in it tie it up and hang it on the door of the toilet. You pull that off and wipe your, <laughs> wipe your bottom with it. <laughs> so I used to say to him, well, this paper is much softer than a new paper. I got away with it. And, oh, uh, the things that I've done, <laughs> it, at, it, you know, when I look back after all 95 years then, I look back and how the heck did I do all this? And, you know, I could go on and on for ages. Otherwise, I should take up two hours in the journey. <laughs> what branch of the service did you serve in? Royal Artillery. And, uh, as I said, I joined the Territorials in 1939-18. And I was 19 when the war started. And it was the Royal Artillery Field Regiment. Now, the difference between that, you had different types of regiments. You had the field regiments, which I'll explain later. Then you had the heavies, and you had the medium guns. Well, mine is a field gun, which is a 25-pounder gun. Now, in, in metres, I couldn't, about 12 and a half, something like that, anyway, in, in uh, metres. But, uh, so that was, um, that's what I, I, I started on. Well, I say started, no. When I got to the drill hall, the what? The, and the drill hall, okay. that is where you join and where you go and serve. It's like a barrack, but it's just a hall because in the territories you only work two evenings a week and one one weekend. And you get, I think, first of all, when you join, you get what they call one shilling. Uh, well, you can't put it in Europe, but one shilling in them days from English money, and you get a shilling which is called the king's shilling. In other words, you've signed up to protect the king in country. And I got a king's shilling, I thought, oh, I've got a fortune. Because, oh, honestly, uh, the money that you had in them, my father was used to have a coal business at Chiselton, and my two brothers, well, I had, um, there was five sisters, uh, six sisters, and five other boys, and I'm the baby of them. All the others are gone. One of the girls died much earlier, before I was born. So my two brothers, uh, my eldest brother was, well, I really didn't see him as a brother. It's more like a father to me. And uh, I only used to see him uh, often, no, not very often. I was old man, he worked in London uh, as a, um, a gardener. And uh, I old remember seeing this chap coming up the path. I couldn't run into mum. Mum, mum. 
Who's that man coming up there? Why, it's your brother Charlie. <laughs> He'd be on my mother. Scared to death. Wonder what the heck he was. Because he was, what, 56 years old than me, nearly. God almighty. And he died in 1957. Well then, of course, I had another brother, Jack, Michael Henry, but we always called him Jack. Now, he joined in 19, 1918, and he went into the Royal Corps Signals, and he served out in India, and in, during that time, it become very, very important. Him and another uh, signaler that put the first wireless in an aeroplane in India, not in England, in India. And he was on what they call the northwest frontier, as between Pakistan, which is now, and Afghanistan, the northwest frontier. And uh, he was on guard there quite a lot. But this plane was used that they could fly over the over Afghanistan and see the dope coming in. All the dope coming in. And they could drive it all back to the guard who prepared to, to uh, capture them. And uh, eventually, anyway, he uh, came out of the army in 1924. And he then joined Marconi. You know Marconi? The radio people that first started off, but he joined Marconi, and he then was an a, a engineer in the Marconi radio station at Bangor, which is down in Cornwall. But from there, when the war started, it was what is known as on the reserve. So you serve seven years at regular, and then when you come out, you have seven years as a reserve. And my brother George and my brother Tom, they were all on the reserve. So when the war started, they were all called up. And Tom and George, um, George was in the Wiltshire Regiment, Tom was in the Somerset Light Infantry. Well, Jack was then posted to a place called Portis Head, which is at Bristol, down the southwest again. And that station was used primarily for secret messages going out to all the other countries, and including messages from Churchill to Roosevelt and places like that. So he was called up, but then turned around and had to go back because he was in a very important job and he had to go back. So he never served anything in the army during the war. But during the war, he, uh, he uh, had a, an amateur radio up in his attic, and he used to use that. Well, when the war started, all these amateur radios were you know, stopped. We weren't meant to use them. So, but they insisted him to use these. So when he come off of duty, it would go on and listen to enemy code coming out, Morse code. I could pass it on, and he done that virtually all the time through the war. And at one stage, he, uh, you, you wouldn't hear it, I mean, this is you, uh, before you was ever born. But at one stage, the Italian fleet was in a place called Taranto Harbour in Italy. And he got a message from Morse code, through, it's from the Italian Navy, it come through, saying that the fleet was in Toronto Harbour. That message was immediately transferred to the Admiralty, and the following day, their bomber 
Arabs went out and sunk the whole damn lot. Everything was gone. So your brother really was responsible. The Italians out. Well, they were never any good anyway at fighting. <laughs> well, they'd just back up and just walk away. They didn't want Mussolini. They didn't want anything. They were very much like what Hitler had done to these people. Brainwash. You do as I tell you, otherwise I'll shoot you. So that's what happened to them. So when I come uh, regard now, back to when I was the war starting, well, we never left England until the 24th of June. That was about 14 days or 10 days after the 12 days after the landing. Now, if you can understand what happened at the landing, the first thing that happens, they have to get ashore and they have to form what you call a beachhead. You know what a beachhead is? Yes. Well, that took them 10 days. And then time we come, the whole beachhead was 10 miles in. Bay Year was declared an open city. They were 10 miles in and a 55 mile front, including all the Americans and me. So you had Utah Beach, Omaha, Gold Beach, uh, Juno Beach, and Sword Beach, all joined together. So if you work that out, 55 miles by 10 miles deep, at what, 550 square miles. So there was sufficient room then for the, what we call the breakout division, which was including my division, the 4th and West, the 15th Scots, the 11th Army Division, the 53rd Welsh, and uh, uh, the 23rd Hussars and the 49th West Riding Division. And we all landed within about oh, a week. But we were held up in the channel for four days because of the uh, a gale. Now, you've heard of the Mulberry Harbour. Yes. Well, it's out here anyway, part of it. Well, the Americans had one of their own, and we had ours here. Americans had one at Omaha, and we had one here at Aramachi. Well, that was fine. Now, Montgomery was a man of his own. He made his own plan. Irrespective of what Eisenhower said, or Churchill, or even General Morgan, who started the whole uh, getting the thing ready, they said to you know, well, this is how it's going to work. You go in first, I'm talking now, the breakout division. You will go in first, the first, uh, sorry, the first day when they landed, they had to capture Khan. And same day, they were supposed to capture Hill 112. But well, Montgomery had his own plan. He said, no, not to them. He never even told the Americans, never told Churchill, he never told Eisner. He made his own plan. He decided, I oh, knew better than anybody else. He was a bit of an arrogant boat. So his plan was, he wasn't going to capture Khan, he wasn't going to ca uh, capture Hill 112, he was going to leave that, and he was going to help the Americans from Omaha and Utah to capture Sherbrooke Harbor. Now that was important because when you come to Singapore, all the supplies for America had to come to England and then back to France. So if they could get Sherbrooke, they could bring it all in. But then, unfortunately, it backfired on uh, Montgomery because the American Mulberry Harbor was destroyed. That meant the Americans had to use Air Harbor and they had, had wanted more supplies because they had more troops than we did. So we had to share there with their, you know, with all their supplies. But then the air supplies were very, very short. And it was during the gale that this, most of this happened. And that made us a very, very dangerous position. But if Jerry had known that, he would have certainly pushed her back into the sea. Right. What was
was your specialty? What did you do specifically with your regiment? <laughs> well, <laughs> if we go back when I joined, I joined as a gunner, which is like a private. <laughs> and <laughs> when we, we first went in, the drill, as I was saying, we come up against World War I guns. Nothing else, one gun, and we should have had 24 guns. The big wheels, which is the wheels that you use for horse drawn, and the limber, which is the ammunition carry, just the same. And they were adapted to put on the back of a vehicle in 1938, when they thought the war was coming. And when we went out training, we only took the one gun and the one limber, and the limber had to act as a gun. Yeah. What they used to put the gun in, and the crew would make it, and then they'd put the limber in, and make him believe that it was a gun. So everybody, they had six people on the gun. Number one was a sergeant, number two was a bombardier, number three was a gunner, number four was a gunner, number five was a gunner, and number six was a, still a gunner. So you had six men in that uh, little team. Well, in 1941, uh, something amazing happened to me. Now, I didn't know it was at the time, but I was placed into a, a section, a gun section, which is the six men, with a, a, a sergeant called Ted Keel. Kill was a TA bloke who worked during the daytime, but he was almost like a regular soldier. It, the discipline that he had oh, was absolutely terrendous. Everybody was scared to death of him. And I remember somebody said, What section are you in? I said, With Ted Kill. Oh, my God, I feel sorry for you. I said, Why? God, he's seen a chaser from anywhere. I could say something else, but I won't on camera. But he said, he keep chasing and chasing you. Oh, well, fine. Well, at that time, or before, going back again, because I have to, my memory is not quite so good as it used to be. Well, when my brother George come home on leave from the Wiltshire Regiment, he had what they call furlongs or leaves every so often. No use of worrying to death. What did you do in there, George? What was you doing this? Well, what was happening to you? And in the end, he said, I'm fed up with you, Albert. Grab that broomstick on you. Oh, why? Come with me down the path. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to tell you and show you how to stand at ease. Oh, yeah. Put, your, uh, put the uh, broomstick handle out, what? And then, no, stand the ease. So when I shout, I turn shun, you pull yourself up. Oh, okay. Well, about four times. That's not the way to do it. Keep doing it. All right. Then he said, that's fine, that's fine. Now. Right, now I'm going to show you how to shoulder arms. Oh, my God. So I stand to attention, couple of broomsticks, shoulder arms, up, down, down, down. Well, not quite right. Do it by numbers. Well, attention. One, two, up, three, four, four, down. Stand to attention. And that's how we've learned how to do it. Well, when I go back now into when I first went in, when the war started, we only had this one gun, and all that we could do was to stand behind it and be explained to us how this gun works. But my attitude was that I joined the Royal Artillery. I want to fire that damn gun. I don't want anything else. No. All I had to do was rifle drill and marching drill. Well, that was simple to me. I mean, 
I can, when they send this attention, I can do everything, show it around, stand to attention. And I remember Ted Keel, and I didn't know him that such then, he was a sergeant, and I remember him looking at me, and he called me out to the front. He said, right, this is how it should be done. You watch Gunner Feet. And there was me standing at the front, showing them how to do it. Of course, at the end of the day, everybody turned and said, how the hell did you work that out, Ricky? I said, well, my brother told me. Oh, my God. Well, that went on, and eventually, he had, from what I heard from it after the war, he said, well, I could tell you, know, Albert, he said, you were a potential NCO, no doubt about it, he said. You were so quick to learn, and you're always making a challenge, you wanted to do this and do that. Well, that's how the challenges are. That's me, it's exactly what everybody should do. You've got a challenge, you want to do this, you want to make a good show of it. You're interviewing me. At the end of the day, when that comes out and goes into DVD, you have to look at it and say, did I make a good job of that? Or do I chuck it in the fire? <laughs> it's true, isn't it? All of you. So, at the end, I wonder was it, um, anyway, in the, gone to a, a new village, well, you know what a village is, and we went to a new village, and I went on leave, and I went down with pleurisy and pneumonia, and I was out in hospital for six weeks. Well, after all that time, what they would have normally done is to send me back to the Royal Artillery Depot in Woolwich in London, which is where they would start. But no, I had a message that went through my doctors, uh, or the hospital, when Albert Fick is, is sent out the hospital, he got to ring the commander of my regiment and tell him that he's going to be discharged from the hospital. Oh. Well, he said, what he done then? He said, I should, um, he made your steel perfume. He contacted the um, Royal Artillery and said, we don't want Fick to go back there, we want him back in the regiment. Oh, that was good. Well, within a week being back, I had my first strike, Lance Bombardier. And within three months, I was two strikes, two and a full Bombardier. And by the end of 41, I was a full sergeant, three strokes and a gun on the top. Now that's not that like gun from 1939 to the end of 41, getting from a gunner to a full sergeant. And this is all while training still? Yes, oh yeah, yeah. As I said, we didn't run until 24. Well, we're all right now, we'll go on to the land. Well, Albert, be, you started in 1940, which year did you start with in the service? 1940? No, I started in 1939. 1939, and you yeah. trained all the way through till? 1944. Did you trained for yes. five years? Yes. And where were you training? All over the southeast of England. That is where I met my wife when we got married, around that area. And we finished up, we finished up, we finished up at, uh, well, we went up to York, the town of York, right up the north. And we went on a big, big exercise with the tanks infantry to give them an idea, or give all of us, the commanders, an idea what they're going to do when the invasion. Well, we didn't know when the invasion came up, nobody knew. And it was then, uh, we moved from York and went to a place called Eastbourne, that's in Sussex, and we was 
there about November 43, and by, on the 6th of June, my troop commander, Captain Carter, come down, rushed down to our parade at six and half past six in the morning, shouting, he said, the invasion started, our troops have landed, troops have landed in Normandy. Of course, everybody got excited. Well, when are we going? Well, we've got to wait. We've got to wait. Well, we waited then until... Is that all right? Mm. Oh, that's good. No gin in it, though, is there? started. Well, previously to that, about a month or so before, we started what they call waterproofing the guns and the vehicles. I mean, because we were told about a week after that we would be going uh, on a big ship and then all the guns and everything would be derricked down onto a landing craft. Well, that's fine. And then to practice that, <coughs> they've dug, I don't know, all the engineer made uh, improvised landing craft, but what they done, they dug in the ground and built the sides up and the ramp, so that you just walk, run down there, stop there, that's on your landing craft, and then you come out the other side of you're going on the beach. That was a practice one, because they never had enough landing craft in which you to use the real one. So we practiced that. Well then, as I said, he come out and said the water, you know, the sand, and we walked around the waterproof. So we were all getting excited, and I can tell you, everyone uh, in the, well I would say in the whole army, was so excited that this war has started. Well, I, don't know why. I know we sound, it sounds stupid, but I was so excited that when I was called up, well, I had to ride five miles to the drill hall, and it used to take me about uh, three quarters of an hour, and I'd done it in less than half an hour. That's how I passed on way. Oh, I couldn't get there quick enough. Of course, then when we come to the landing, at first we moved from Eastbourne all the way through, half through in London, to a place called Tilbury, Tilbury Docks. That is where our boat was waiting for us. And we went under campus in tents in an area that was closed off so that nobody could get in and nobody could get out. And we stopped there. Now this was on the night of the 11th and 12th of June, near my birthday. And whilst there, about midnight, the ACAC guns, the anti-aircraft gun, opened up, and we see the, well, we saw it was planes coming over, the planes shooting at the back, and the guns were banging and banging away, and I remember saying to my gunner, look at them guns, I said, if we can do as good as them, we'll win the war within a couple of weeks, because then you know what was there. It was what they call these doodle bugs. They fly in bombs. The flame was shooting out, we thought they'd hit them. Well then the message came over the tunnel saying, what we're seeing now is a flying bomb. As soon as the planes go out the back, they shoot straight down and they explode. And we see half a dozen what that come down during the evening when we're there. Absolutely amazing. And that was just really the first time that anybody had seen 
anything like that in, the, in any war. And then, of course, the next one come up was the B-2, which is the rocket. But that was worse than ever, because nobody could hear it. I mean, you know, or from me, what you've learned, the amount of bombing that was done in London, and the amount of destroyed, absolutely horrendous, horrendous, thousands and thousands. I know a load of kids and parents, they used to go down to the underground station and south or under there. Well, the schools had what they call Anderson shelters. They were made of metal, you put them up, and you cover them with sword and everything like that, and you get in there. But also, you had what they call bunkers. They'd been made of concrete. They were done about six months before the war started, and they were dropped in the ground. And one occasion, when Jerry came over, all these school kids were in it, and they dropped the bomb right on top and killed the whole lot. Everyone. And there's a monument in London for commemorating all of them. And the people out in America, I mean, I know they were late in coming in. And we all, when I meet an American, they make me choose. I would say, yeah, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have won the war. No matter how late you were coming, you were very welcome to come. Because <laughs> they were late on the First World War. So, really, quite frankly, we have to accept the fact that the Americans really won the war for us. Because without their production, and without the amount of forces, when you think of it, they were fighting on two, three fronts. Not just with us, but out in Japan, Cotton McCraw, all over the place. Now, really, I mean, America won the war for war. But I say, the works of Adolf the Luber, but it certainly wasn't prepared. It's only when Roosevelt got them all together, right so, we've got to start producing. And what, within the 12 months, supplies were coming to England. And the first supplies was Sherman tank that went to Egypt, Al Alamein. And that is what really turned the battle over by Montgomery that won that battle. And at the end of the day, when they get into Sicily, then from Sicily into Italy, you could almost say the Germans on the run. And they never stopped really quite badly. So I'm now gone up to what? Uh, uh, 94, 1994. <laughs> so now we're coming to another phase of the war. This is when the invasion started, and we were late in getting in. But, as I said, Montgomery made his own plan, and the Mulberry Harbour upset him. Well, eventually they captured Sherbert, that fortnight late, and they come back. One army went up and captured um, St. Inglis, where the pirates had landed, and the other army, the first army, come back towards us. And then they started Operation Copper. And Copper was the operation that took them up to capture St. Lo and towards the Palais Gap. You were in the Palais Gap. Well, now on the 10th of July, we put in Operation Jupiter. Epson just finished. Epson just finished at the end of June. And Jupiter started on the 10th of July. And the 43rd Wessex was the main thrust for capture of the hills. Well, when they took We're talking about Hill 112. That's correct. And yeah. this is the war that you were, this is the battle that you were involved in. That's correct. In. So I want to hear 
what you did that time. Well, after it, after it all been, well, it was never captured. The Germans run away, and they were pushing to Pallet's Gap, and they finished up. And time we, time we come away from the hill, the 53rd Welsh went up the hill and reported that there was no Germans there. They'd gone. And we then went into an operation called Blue Coat. Now that was to go and capture a Mount Peacock, which is near the Palais Gap. Now the Lemb Army Division was withdrawn from Air Front and put into Operation Goodwood. And Goodwood was a complete disaster. Within a week, the Lemp Armour Division nearly lost every tank they had. The Canadians and Poles, they were there, and they really were the ones that pushed and made the Palais Gap. With us coming up one side, with Copper and us coming up that side, and Goodwood coming around that side. And at the end of the day, there were 200,000 prisoners taken. But the other half escaped. And they got across the Seine, the River Seine. And by the 16th of September, I'm coming back to the hill again, by the 16th of September, then Operation Mars Garden started on the 17th. Well, you know all about that, so let's go back to the hill now. Well, as I said, it was never captured, it was vacated. Well, I never, I never knew anything about the hill at that stage. All I knew that I was firing on that hill on the 10th of July when the attack went in and there was approximately 275 25 pound guns, there was about 300 medium and about the same number of heavy guns and at the and when you think of it, when you think of it, then you had all the tanks firing, mortars firing, and also you had the, the ships out the channel firing into the enemy, and it was estimated that there was a thousand tons of high explosive going on that hill for oh, five days. Wow. Well, that really quite frankly smashed the Germans. So, we advanced then, anyway, we got to the same, crossed the same, and the British Army went through us, and as I say, we was up there by September. So it only took one month, by the time the hill was captured, or vacated, to get Paris captured, and Port captured, and Brussels captured. Only four weeks, four uh, weeks. Oh my God, it's about 350 kilometers. Fantastic. From the same there. Fantastic. I mean, it shows how important that hill was. Yes. And I've always said, and it's come out many times in historian books, saying that that hill was the cornerstone, the cornerstone of victory in Europe, and Khan as well. So Montgomery's plan worked. Because he was both, according to um, Eisenhower and Churchill's idea, was that he had to be on the same before the 1st of September. Well, he was on the same a week before, a week before. <laughs> Albert, I want to thank you for your story and, t and sharing the time. Well, can I tell you one more thing? Just a little one. <laughs> On the 12th of July this year, 
We are doing the, I've arranged, and I've been doing it now for the last 17 years, project to commemorate all those who died in the Battle Hill 112. Now this year, in July the 12th, we have a big service where the unveiling by a patri, a woman patri, that will do the service and she will then invite the uh, Prince Edward, who's going to be there, to, uh, to unveil a statue, which I've already got, and has been donated, and also a £25 gun, and also a 112 trees.